Geochemistry is the science that uses the tools and principles of chemistry to explain the mechanisms behind major geological systems such as the Earth's crust and its oceans. The realm of geochemistry extends beyond the Earth, encompassing the entire solar system and has made important contributions to the understanding of a number of processes including mantle convection, the formation of planets and the origins of granite and basalt. History the term geochemistry was first used by the Swiss-German chemist Christian Friedrich Schaparograf NBEIN in 1838. In his paper, Schaparograf NBEIN predicted the birth of a new field of study, stating, In a word, a comparative geochemistry ought to be launched, before geochemistry can become geology, and before the mystery of the genesis of our planets and their inorganic matter may be revealed. The field began to be realized a short time after Schaparograph NBEIN's work, but his term geochemistry was initially used neither by geologists nor chemists and there was much debate over which of the two sciences should be the dominant partner. There was little collaboration between geologists and chemists and the field of geochemistry remained small and unrecognized. In the late 19th century a Swiss man by the name of Victor Goldschmidt was born, who later became known as the father of geochemistry. His paper, Jechmisch Vertilungsgesetz der Element, on the distribution of elements in nature has been referred to as the start of geochemistry. During the early 20th century, a number of geochemists produced work that began to popularize the field, including Frank Wigglesworth Clark who had begun to investigate the abundances of various elements within the Earth and how the quantities were related to atomic weight. The composition of meteorites and their differences to terrestrial rocks was being investigated as early as 1850 and in 1901, Oliver C. Farrington hypothesized although there were differences, that the relative abundances should still be the same. This was the beginnings of the field of cosmochemistry and has contributed much of what we know about the formation of the Earth and the solar system. Subfields some subsets of geochemistry are, isotope geochemistry involves the determination of the relative and absolute concentrations of the elements and their isotopes in the Earth and on Earth's surface. Examination of the distribution and movements of elements in different parts of the Earth and in minerals with a goal to determine the underlying system of distribution and movement. Cosmochemistry includes the analysis of the distribution of elements and their isotopes in the cosmos. Biogeochemistry is the field of study focusing on the effect of life on the chemistry of the Earth. Organic geochemistry involves the study of the role of processes and compounds that are derived from living or once living organisms. Aqueous geochemistry studies the role of various elements in watersheds, including copper, sulfur, mercury, and how elemental fluxes are exchanged through atmospheric terrestrial aquatic interactions. Regional, environmental and exploration geochemistry includes applications to environmental, hydrological and mineral exploration studies. Victor Goldschmidt is considered by most to be the father of modern geochemistry and the ideas of the subject were formed by him in a series of publications from 1922 under the title A Euro Jechmisch Vertilungsgesetz der Elemente Euro Unregistered Trademark. Chemical Characteristics the more common rock constituents are nearly all oxides. Chlorides, sulfides and fluorides are the only important exceptions to this and their total amount in any rock is usually much less than 1%. F. W. Clark has calculated that a little more than 47% of the Earth's crust consists of oxygen. It occurs principally in combination as oxides, of which the chief are silica, alumina, iron oxides, and various carbonates. The silica functions principally as an acid, forming silicates, and all the commonest minerals of igneous rocks are of this nature. From a computation based on 1672 analyses of numerous kinds of rocks Clark arrived at the following as the average percentage composition of the Earth's cursed, CO2 equals 59.71, Al203 equals 15.41, Fe203 equals 2.63, FeO equals 3.52, MgO equals 4.36, KO equals 4.90, Na2O equals 3.55, K2O equals 2.80, H2O equals 1.52, TO2 equals 0 0.60, P2O5 equals 0 0.22, total 99.22%. 
all the other constituents occur only in very small quantities, usually much less than 1%. These oxides combine in a haphazard way. For example, potash and soda combine to produce feldspars. In some cases they may take other forms, such as nepheline, eosite, and muscovite, but in the great majority of instances they are found as feldspar. Phosphoric acid with lime forms arpatite. Titanium dioxide with ferrous oxide gives rise to ilmenite. Part of the lime forms lime feldspar. Magnesium carbonate and iron oxides with silica crystallize as olivine or instatite, or with alumina and lime form the complex ferromagnesian silicates of which the pyroxenes, amphiboles, and biotites are the chief. Any excess of silica above what is required to neutralize the bases will separate out as quartz. Excess of alumina crystallizes as corundum. These must be regarded only as general tendencies. It is possible, by rock analysis, to say approximately what minerals the rock contains, but there are numerous exceptions to any rule. Mineral constitution, hence we may say that except in acid or siliceous rocks containing greater than 66% of silica are known as felsic rocks, and quartz is not abundant. In basic rocks it is rare for them to contain as much silicon, these are referred to as mafic rocks. If magnesium and iron are above average while silica is low, olivine may be expected. Where silica is present in greater quantity over ferromagnesian minerals, such as augite, hornblende, instatite or biotite, occur rather than olivine. Unless potash is high and silica relatively low, eosite will not be present, for eosite does not occur with free quartz. Nepheline, likewise, is usually found in rocks with much soda and comparatively little silica. With high alkalis, Soda-bearing pyroxenes and amphiboles may be present. The lower the percentage of silica and alkalis, the greater is the prevalence of plagioclase feldspar as contracted with soda or potash feldspar. The earth crust is composed of 90% silicate minerals and their abundance in the earth is as follows. Plagioclase feldspar, alkali feldspar, quartz, pyroxene, amphiboles, micas, clay minerals, after this the remaining silicate minerals make up another 3% of the Earth's crust. Only 8% of the Earth is composed of non-silicate minerals such as carbonate, oxides, and sulfides. The other determining factor, namely the physical conditions attending consolidation, plays on the whole a smaller part, yet is by no means negligible, as a few instances will prove. Certain minerals are practically confined to deep-seated intrusive rocks, for example, microcline, muscovite, dialage. Eosite is very rare in plutonic masses. Many minerals have special peculiarities in microscopic character according to whether they crystallized in depth or near the surface, for example, hypersthene, orthoclase, quartz. There are some curious instances of rocks having the same chemical composition, but consisting of entirely different minerals, for example, the hornblendite of Gran, in Norway, which contains only hornblende, has the same composition as some of the camptonites of the same locality that contain feldspar and hornblende of a different variety. In this connection we may repeat what has been said above about the corrosion of porphyritic minerals in igneous rocks. In rhyolites and trachytes, early crystals of hornblende and biotite may be found in great numbers partially converted into augite and magnetite. Hornblende and biotite were stable under the pressures and other conditions below the surface, but unstable at higher levels. In the ground mass of these rocks, augite is almost universally present. But the plutonic representatives of the same magma, granite and cyanite contain biotite and hornblende far more commonly than augite. Felsic, intermediate and mafic igneous rocks, those rocks that contain the most silica, and on crystallizing yield free quartz form a group generally designated the felsic rocks. Those again that contain least silica and most magnesia and iron, so that quartz is absent while olivine is usually abundant, form the mafic group. The intermediate rocks include those characterized by the general absence of both quartz and olivine. An important subdivision of these contains a very high percentage of alkalis, especially soda, and consequently has minerals such as nepheline and eosite not common in other rocks. 
it is often separated from the others as the alkali, or soda rocks, and there is a corresponding series of mafic rocks. Lastly a small subgroup rich in olivine and without feldspar has been called the ultramafic rocks. They have very low percentages of silica but much iron and magnesia. Except these last, practically all rocks contain feldspars or feldsporthoid minerals. In the acid rocks the common feldspars are orthoclase, perthite, microcline, and oligoclasia euro all having much silica and alkalis. In the mafic rocks labradorite, anorthite and bitarnite prevail, being rich in lime and poor in silica, potash and soda. Augite is the most common ferromagnesian in mafic rocks, but biotite and hornblende are on the whole more frequent in felsic rocks. Rocks that contain eosite or nepheline either partly or a wholly replacing feldspar, are not included in this table. They are essentially of intermediate or of mafic character. We might in consequence regard them as varieties of cyanite, diorite, gabbra, etc., in which feldsporthoid minerals occur, and indeed there are many transitions between cyanites of ordinary type and nepheline euro, or eosite euro cyanite and between gabbra or dolerite and theralite or essexite. But, as many minerals develop in these alkali rocks that are uncommon elsewhere, it is convenient in a purely formal classification like that outlined here to treat the whole assemblage as a distinct series. This classification is based essentially on the mineralogical constitution of the igneous rocks. Any chemical distinctions between the different groups, though implied, are relegated to a subordinate position. It is admittedly artificial but it has grown up with the growth of the science and is still adopted as the basis on which more minute subdivisions are erected. The subdivisions are by no means of equal value. The cyanites, for example, and the peridotites, are far less important than the granites, diorites and gabbras. Moreover, the effusive andesites do not always correspond to the plutonic diorites but partly also to the gabbras. As the different kinds of rock, regarded as aggregates of minerals, pass gradually into one another, transitional types are very common and are often so important as to receive special names. The quartz cyanites and nordmarkites may be interposed between granite and cyanite, the tonalites and adamelites between granite and diorite, the montesilites between cyanite and diorite, norites and hyperites between diorite and gabbra, and so on. See also Important publications in geochemistry, petrology, tephrochronology, cosmochemistry, further reading, Holland, H.D., and Turekian, K.K. Treatise on Geochemistry 9 volumes. Elsevier, Marshall, C., and Fairbridge, R. Encyclopedia of Geochemistry. ISBN 1-4020-4496-8. Berlin, Springer. Bernard Gunn. The Geochemistry of Igneous Rocks, Gunter Farr, Principles and Applications of Geochemistry, 2nd edition, Prentice Hall. H. R. Rollinson, Using Geochemical Data, Evaluation, Presentation, Interpretation. ISBN 978-0-582-06701-1, W. M. White, Geochemistry. Earth Data Models Library contains a logical data model and physical implementation of a geochemistry database. References